Welcome back, everybody. Hope you're suitably um, refreshed. Um, I'm now delay delighted to introduce um, Steve Hall. Steve is the head of strategic engagement at Hefke, um, has been in post since June of this year. Um, he has two core responsibilities, firstly on counterterrorism and prevent duty, which he will be speaking on today. Um, secondly, on student migration, which we have touched upon earlier. So, uh, <laughs> small issues um, for, for Steve to deal with. Um, he obviously was looking for a challenge as he found life too easy previously, being in, being, uh, in the private office of um, Nick Clegg. Clearly it wasn't enough uh, to get Steve into, so uh, we welcome Steve to Hefke and to our conference. Great, thank you very much, uh, Alex, for the introduction, and uh, thank you for asking me along today. Um, I believe I've got about 15, 20 minutes to, to cover a, a few things about uh, the new Prevent Counterterrorism duty. I'm going to try and cover off three areas. I do recognise one or two faces, so if you've heard me doing this before, I'll try and bring in some new elements as well, so that it's ever so, uh, ever so slightly new for you. Um, but what I'm going to try and cover is, um, first of all, what is the Prevent duty? Uh, secondly, uh, who does it apply to and what does it mean for those people it does apply to? And then thirdly, Possibly most importantly, uh, given that we're currently running a consultation that I would encourage you all to respond to, uh, what's Hefke's role and, and how are we going about carrying out uh, that role in practice? So those are the three things I'm going to try and cover off uh, in as clear and concise a way as possible. Uh, if there are any uh, questions afterwards that I've not managed to cover off or that you uh, have sort of burning issues that occur to you afterwards, please do feel free to grab me or otherwise to email us at prevent at hefke.ac.uk and we'll be happy to come back to you with uh, any more specific, uh, any more specific information, uh, or to meet separately. So, uh, I'll start with the duty. So, um, under the Counterterrorism and Security Act, which went through earlier this year, uh, a range of specified authorities uh, now have a new statutory duty to uh, have due regard to the need to prevent people from being drawn into terrorism. This covers a pretty broad range of uh, institutions. So, it's local authorities, schools, prisons various NHS providers, uh, and most pertinently, and, and why I'm here today, uh, FE colleges and HE providers. Um, this is putting an existing government strategy onto a statutory footing, so this is not an entirely new uh, policy. Prevent is, is one of the strands of the government's counter-terrorism strategy, contest, uh, and has been in place for several years in various forms and was most recently revised in 2011. Uh, some of you may have had some previous engagement with it. I suspect not that many from, uh, from many of the previous sort of engagement events we've been doing around this duty. Uh, and much of the focus so far has been voluntary and based on particular uh, priority areas geographically in the country. And I think largely it's fair to say on sort of some of the larger funded providers in those geographical locations. The important words obviously in this duty are due regard. Uh, I think that's a, a classic bit of, of um, legal, uh, legal wording which needs a little bit of unpacking uh, to work, out, work through what that means. So it's defined as uh, pr that providers will need to place an appropriate amount of weight on the need to prevent people from being drawn into terrorism in the carrying out of their everyday functions. So I think there's kind of two important parts to that, which is first of all, appropriate amount of weight. So this is intended to be implemented in a proportionate and risk-based way and not to be uh, a sort of huge overreaction to, um, to low levels of risk. Uh, and um, on the second half of that, in the carrying out of your everyday functions, it is not intended that this should lead to huge swathes of, of new work which go out of the, the realms of what you would do in your everyday business uh, as a provider. So I think one of the myths that has sprung up around, around the duty is that this will require sort of some new monitoring of students or close surveillance of students in some way. That absolutely isn't the case. This is about identifying areas of risk within your current business and within your current dealings with students and having policies and processes in place to deal with those risks. So there are two sets of guidance that sit under the duty. Uh, one is general and for all of these specified authorities across different sectors and the other is very specifically for HE providers. Uh, there's also a set for FE providers, if, if uh, anyone in the room is also uh, teaching further education. 
Um, the general one uh, sets out a number of, of fairly generic principles around senior ownership of Prevent within the organisation uh, and, um, and a partnership working with other local Prevent partners. And specific guidance then sets out a series of particular actions that HE providers will need to show that they have considered uh, when they are implementing this duty. It's probably worth just going back a step in terms of what PREVENT is there to try and do and what PREVENT is about. It's probably worth emphasising straight away that PREVENT is the strand of the counter-terrorism strategy that is about the non-criminal space. So this isn't about people who have committed criminal acts or uh, acts of terrorism. It is about identifying vulnerability and risk of people being drawn towards terrorism and potential criminality and about reducing and mitigating those risks. I'll move on to who the duty applies to. So the duty applies directly to proprietors and governing bodies, is the words that are used in the legislation of uh, HE providers. I think with some structures for providers, that's actually quite tricky to unpack exactly what governing bodies and, pro and proprietors might mean. Um, we are taking that to mean uh, owners, most senior people within organisations, but it's board level uh, sort of management and ownership of this and responsibility for it. I think if people have particular issues about how this might apply to their own institution, we'll be very happy to discuss that and work through uh, any of the sort of legalities around it. And it applies the duty to three particular groups of HE providers. So first of all, uh, all providers who receive funding from HEFKE and are directly funded by HEFKE. Secondly, uh, any alternative provider who receives student loan funding has specific course designation to be able to receive student loan funding. And thirdly, uh, and this is quite a new category, I think, in the sort of uh, the, the framework around uh, HE, is um, any other provider offering HE to more than 250 students. Uh, I cannot give you a particularly good reason why 250 was the limit that was picked by the Home Office for that legislation. Um, I, it's intended to capture a level of proportionality around the risk, but the 250 figure is, is relatively uh, arbitrary. That doesn't include distance learning students, but does include international students, part-time, so it's a headcount measure, and doesn't distinguish between international and domestic students. Um, for FE providers, it's, it's a similar sort of, of definition, so it's around links to the amount of SFA funding that you receive, or alternatively, it's private providers with 250 plus students on FE courses, so it's quite a similar, uh, it's quite a similar um, definition. In terms of the, what this means for those providers that are, that are covered, the bare minimum that uh, the guidance sets out is that every provider will be expected to undertake a risk assessment and to draw up an action plan that responds to those risks, uh, addressing the, the exact wording of, of the uh, legislation, so addressing the risks of uh, people possibly being drawn into terrorism within their own setting. And then beneath that risk assessment and action plan, what we'll be looking for is for people to have addressed the particular points in the guidance in a proportionate and contextual way that fits with their own setting and their own uh, culture in their organisation. So we are expecting, it's worth saying at this point, this to look completely different for different providers uh, and this not to be a tick box exercise of you must show us that you have done this particular thing. We're expecting instead to see the thought and the workings and the linkages between um, the risks that you've identified and the activity that you're taking. That's obviously tricky, I think, and means that, that we recognise that there will need to be a level of support, particularly for those who haven't engaged with this previously. Uh, that's something that, that we're currently working through, and I'll say a bit more about in a moment. Although, as a starting point, please feel free to talk to uh, my team or uh, Rob Stroud's team, who you'll be hearing from in a moment, uh, uh, at Hefke and the, the alternative provider uh, engagement team within Hefke. So, Hefke's role in all of this Hefke has been appointed the uh, monitoring authority for the duty in the HE sector in England. Uh, that means we don't set the policy. The policy is set by Home Office and by BIS and has already gone through Parliament and been uh, agreed at this stage. Uh, what it does mean is that we are um, 
responsible for the implementation of this policy and responsible for overseeing that within universities and, and other providers. So that means gathering evidence, making assessments about whether providers are compliant or not, and reporting those findings back on a regular basis to government. What, at the, we're consulting at the moment on um, how we will start to collect that evidence. It's probably worth highlighting just a couple of elements of the timeline of this process, which I think are probably important for people to understand, which is the consultation will close next Friday. So if people haven't uh, already seen it and commented, I would encourage you to do so. We'll then be looking beyond that to publish a final monitoring framework document in November at some point. Um, and alongside that, we will also publish uh, some further information on the sorts of things that HEFCI will be looking for in the assessment process as we go through this. So I would again stress this won't be a tick box boilerplate uh, templates for people to follow, but will set out some of the areas we would expect people have, to have considered, even if they've considered and uh, decided that they don't apply to their particular setting or context, will set out the sorts of things we'd expect to see considered as part of this. And then what, when the next stage after that will be the things that we begin to require from providers and the evidence that we begin to ask for. The two key dates in the first year here are um, January of next year, where we will be looking for um, as, me well, as many uh, of those that we've identified across the sector who are subject to this duty. There's, there's still some work for us to do with the other category of providers with 250 plus HE students, but we will be expecting the vast majority of providers to send us a self-assessment, uh, which sets out um, how they think they are currently matched against the guidance and how close they think they are to compliance. Um, there's certainly been a little bit of misunderstanding of this particular uh, element of what we're asking for, I think, in some of the engagement events we've done around the consultation. So I'd, I'd just like to stress at this point, this is a genuine self-assessment exercise. It is, we are genuinely asking for your own view and your own organisational view of, um, of how uh, far away from being compliant you think you are. This will not be used as part of the monitoring process or any individualised data uh, used for reporting to government. The two things we will be using it for will be one to give a sort of snapshot baseline uh, of um, readiness across the sector which will be reported back to government so just an idea of, of how close uh, institutions might be uh, and then uh, secondly we'll be using it then for the next phase of targeted engagement and support that HEFCI will be offering to make sure that actually we are um, utilising our resource and the resource of the BIS, uh, FE, HE Prevent Coordinators properly to, um, to make sure that, that people are as prepared for this as they can possibly be. And then the second key date will be in the spring summer of next year when we will be looking for uh, more detailed information from providers and more detailed evidence about how they have responded to the duty and to the guidance underneath it. Um, this is, I think it's fair to say, looks at quite a different process from lots of other uh, pieces of, of Hefke's regular accountability work, possibly looks quite and feels quite different from uh, other parts of the sort of framework around higher education as well. Uh, we are seeing this first year very much as different, I think, from the ongoing process, uh, simply because this duty is new, is very politically high profile, and there is a real desire from government to make sure we have a robust understanding of how it's being implemented in practice. So actually, we'll be asking for quite detailed information, potentially, uh, depending on uh, how much actually you've decided within your own, your own context and your own risks there is for you to do. But we'll be asking for um, you to really be showing the workings of how you've gone through your risks and how you've decided the particular actions that you're going to take in response to those risks. So I think this, this initial phase, um, I've, I've heard at previous things there being some questioning about, you know, is this, uh, is this a sort of a completely uh, low burden process? Uh, I, I think we would accept that the initial phase is probably a little more onerous than we might necessarily like, but beyond that first phase, once we're able to provide that assurance back to government that these policies and procedures are in place, we would expect this to feel much more light touch and much more around self-assurance and self-declaration uh, and updates on particular issues and reviews and, and incidents which have occurred through the course of the year. 
And then the final thing I'll say, I'm not sure how I'm doing for time, but the final thing I'll say is around uh, sanctions and consequences um, of, of not complying with the duty. Um, the way that the duty is written into, into the legislation, the only official sanction, formal sanction that sits with it is uh, a direction from the Home Secretary to take particular action to address issues. Um, I think this is an extreme uh, sanction that we would only expect to be used in, in incredibly rare circumstances and where all other avenues had been exhausted. So where there are just uh, issues to be resolved, we expect that to be done through conversation and negotiation through us and you as providers and, and not through any sort of formal sanction or uh, punitive regime. It's very much intended to be a partnership really between us and you as the providers to try and make sure that we have understood the process that you've gone through and that where necessary we're asking the challenging questions that we need to be able to to then offer that assurance to government that these are robust and suitable procedures for the kinds of risks that you've identified in your own setting and as I say in some cases I think particularly with very small very specialist providers I can imagine that this will look very minimal compared to on the other hand in in uh, our regulatory regime, we will also be capturing universities in major city centres with 30,000 students. So clearly the, the, the difference in how we would expect those providers to implement this is, is stark, um, I think. So the final points I will just emphasise, and then I'll stop and see if we've got any time for, um, for any questions or any queries or points. But I would just emphasise, first of all, the consultation documents out there, it sets out some of these evidence gathering requirements and some of the timescales. I would encourage you to, uh, to um, respond to the consultation if there are particular elements of that you think we can improve or that are areas of concern to you. And I think particularly we're keen to hear the AP perspective and the sort of private um, provider perspective given that um, I think that that's probably the area of this where this will feel less familiar. Uh, and then these key dates we'll be looking at will be this initial self-assessment process in January and then a more detailed evidence gather in June, in uh, May, June, July. And what we'll be looking to do between now and then is make sure that we are ensuring that the support isn't there that you need. Um, we'll hopefully be able to announce a little bit more alongside the monitoring framework about how we'll deliver some of that and particularly uh, some of the training available. Um, but in the meantime, we're very much treating this as an engagement exercise and our door is open if people have uh, the need for more information or more support at this point. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Steve. Unfortunately, no time for questions right, right now, but I think Steve is hanging around for a bit today. So if you want to catch him at, at lunch, he'll be a, 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 a stationary victim, a target, um, willing victim. Um, we are, however, planning a dedicated event on the prevent duty, which I believe is going to take place on the 9th of December. If you'd like to put that in your diaries now, we will be releasing information in, in due course. Uh, we have Hefke, but also um, Biz, the Home Office, um, hopefully the Office for Security and Counterterrorism, and an experienced lawyer who will be able to um, um, explain how this will impact on your business.